So, if I think to channel Hamlet, so I'm going to ask Dr. Mendes if you don't know if anybody has any relationship here. So, channel Hamlet. The date is 1849, family evictions, and strange enough, a lot of the local law in the parish would be vague enough on the family. But definitely, on these evictions, it stayed in the, folk, in the local folklore, and it was taught in the primary school, in my primary school, and then it was the primary school in the 1950, and uh, it was part of the topics that we were taught. The family was never mentioned with this eviction because, I presume, being post famine, it was very, very fresh in the minds of the people. Now, the first um, point of corporate call that I could get any information on those who were at land was in the title of document for the town lands and dealings. And the title of document books were comp compiled between 23 and 47 in order to determine the amount which occupiers of agricultural holdings over one acre to pay in tithes to the Trust of Ireland. <coughs> and, you see, um, to determine the amount, up to that, the Church of Ireland ministers were paid in kind. They might get hay, they might get turf, they might get corn, they might get fowl, you know, and calf, and animal or whatever. So, this was to determine the amount. <coughs> And in many instances, it, it led to problems because there are cases of where the Church of Ireland minister was supposed to get an acre, uh, one tenth of an acre of corn, and he had a disagreement with the tenant, and the tenant left the corn standing. So the Church of Ireland guy left the corn, and he left them and refused to give it to him. There's a case in Dunmore where a uh, brace of fowl was supposed to be given to the Protestant minister, and there was some kind of a disagreement between the tenant and the Protestant minister, and he did he did appear with his grace of fowl to one day old chickens. <laughs> he was to the letter of the law, there was no way, but it was true. Okay? So they needed to standardize it, and just there, just a piece of information, grazing land had the exemption, and grazing land was held by landlords. So the landlords generally speaking didn't have to pay. <coughs> paying kind instead of money, I dealt with that. Uh, <coughs> the tithe was calculated on the average price of oats and wheat between 1816 and 1823. And the quantity then was determined on the land which was graded between one and four. Very good to very bad. So they graded the land and they took the price of oats, the, the average, between 18, <coughs> 1816 and 1823. Uh, certain crops were taxable depending on the parish. But it is in some cases were taxable in other parishes they were. Okay. So they needed to standardize it basically. So uh, dealing with this strong land, one pillar, just, uh, that's the way it was spelled in the title of property in 1826. Uh, and <clears throat> zoning in on four families Patrick Connell, John Lennon, Dan Lennon, and John McMahony. That's the first point of contact that I had on the landowners that were in, or the land tenants that were in the town land. Okay? <clears throat> and there's one other town land that enters into the fray, and that is the town land of Provence French, where John Cashman and Dennis Cashman had 56 acres between. Between 1826 and Griffith's valuation, there's really no information that I can gather. So I have to go back to the 1826 to find out those who were in the various homelands. The census returns. In Bunkhida, in 1841, you had 191 people, 1851-35. And in one of our chair, which is another townland, you had 118 and 12. And they're the two townlands uh, from which the tenants were living. I'm only dealing with one, the town land is one killer. I want to deal with more than sure. Henry B. Wise was the landlord for one killer, and this is the first record I can get of him after 1820. He wasn't the landlord in 1826. 
So between 1826 and 1846, Henry Weiss took over the land and he gave five pounds to the poor relief of the fund for the district. Now, looking at the house books, which are the preparatory books for Griffith's valuation, looking at those, Thomas Madigan was the man who reported on the town land of Bunkerville on the 2nd of February 1849, and he said John Mahoney, his house was unoccupied. Dennis Cashman, who had been in a different town land, his house is also unoccupied. And Michael Connell, his house is unoccupied. Do Sorry? Do they know where they went? Alright, we deal with that. <laughs> now, then Hens also appeared in 1826. And from, uh, from the house books, the Lenins had gone out of the town land of Montreal and they had gone to Fort. And this is just something that you can get in the house books. Dennis Lenin, he was now occupying a house where McCarthy was living up to 1849. So you can get little bits of information like that about those who were occupying various houses. So McCarthy was there at the 49, and then Dennis Lenin had moved in and was in there on the 2nd of February when the <coughs> houses were being <coughs> assessed for Griffiths. Now these are just, there will be pages of these. You can see the lines drawn through. Okay? In other words, this is Madigan's report. These guys, their houses are not great. There are more of these here. So in 1849, you had 33 houses listed as an occupant. And this uh, just going through various forms. Now, here are what are called perambulation books. And a perambulation book is perambulation means to walk around. So the landlord is going to sell or try to sell, he's evicting his tenants, he wants to try and get other better money or more people in or get them all out, make a big one big farm of it. So a perambulation book is where they walk around, walk around and look at the land. So there are a whole lot of these. Michael Connell, he had house offices and land, a hilltop, he had pasture in good condition, he had also wash, there's a, a river going through it, and um, so on. And you'll get that on all the farms that were there before the eviction. This, is, as I say, is a perambulation book. These are just pages of the perambulation. You can see various ones there. Uh, Cashman has a house office land. <coughs> there are, uh, two, three rent each. Uh, pasture and so on. They're very, very difficult to read. Which you can pick up words like grazing, pasture, rough land, wash, gravel, uh, bog. You can get words like that coming through. This again is another one. They're all, and you can see how faint they are. And this is the report of the 6th of September 1850. Since the town land was perambulated, the immediate deserts have been evicted, and all the tenants turned out by the head landlord, Henry Wise Esquire, who has the forfeiture of the entire town land, and has thrown down some of the tenants' houses. And that's important, some and some of the tenants are promised their land again. So whatever he was doing, he evicted everybody, but some may well have got back to them. <coughs> and this was a report by Thomas Kill on the 6th of September. And looking at Griffith's valuation, this is the town land, as you can see, unoccupied, unoccupied, unoccupied. Okay? So the perambulation report is 1850, Griffith's is 1851. So we've gone through from 49 when we have the house books to the perambulation to the valuation. Are there any questions there? Are you okay on that? Alright. No, it's a test for you. Anybody know what that word means? Good man? Covered by. Covered by. Almost there. In, in, in modern parlance, in, in, in today's speech, Talk in America, the Winter Battle, the Camper Battle, okay? And <clears throat> the Winter Battle were a tribe of Indians, or 
indigenous peoples, Native Americans. And they originally occupied an area from South Carolina to the lower Mississippi to present-day Wisconsin, the Dakotas and Montana. That was their, their hunting ground. They were forced relocation. Many members returned to their previous homes, especially in Wisconsin, despite the U.S. Army's repeated roundups and removals. And you know this from your westerns and cowboys and Indians and whatever. They were continually being moved on, sent into reservations. But the Winnebago continually went back, tried to go back to Wisconsin to their home. Okay. Their territory, <clears throat> the number of white people that moved into their territory doubled between 1840 and 1846, over 100,000 settlers in what were their bombing grounds. And the US government finally allowed them to homestead land in the state. So the main, main body of the Winnebago Indians now live in Wisconsin. And the census, there are 7,192, that's in the 2011 census, members of the tribe in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and they own 4,602 acres. And they operate six casinos in Wisconsin to generate revenue, to support economic development, infrastructure, health care, and education. So that's what the fact that the tribe has been reduced to just that number of 7,000 members and 2,000 acres. No, or 4,000 acres. Okay? Lennon. Thomas Lennon was born in Durham, 1788. And he was a pioneer in Wisconsin in the early 1840s. That's before the major influx of white people. Between 40, 1840 and 1860, over 100,000 were intercepted. So he was there as a very, very early pioneer. Yeah. Daniel Lennon and his sons, five of them, established farms in Kildare Township in Wisconsin in 1857. And by 1846, they sold their farms to relatives and moved to Minnesota, where they were a homestead for $15. When they went to Wisconsin, it was $2.50 an acre. Entrepreneurs in New York had moved in and bought some of the, uh, said that they had taken some of the land from the Indians and they sold it on to somebody else. Whereas in Minnesota, they were homestead for $15. So the Lenins who had moved into Wisconsin saw their opportunity and moved out to Minnesota. Mike and his family emigrated in 1854 through New Orleans and they farmed in Iowa. <coughs> Timothy in Wisconsin. John in Wisconsin and Lennon Valley. There's a valley in Wisconsin called Lennon Valley. And if we look at the names, Sheehan, very important man up here in the corner, Lennon, Sullivan, Donahue, Lennon, 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 uh, Callahan, O'Brien, and so on. Okay? They are people that have, have just settled in there post fan in the 1850s. Okay? You can see there's quite a uh, lot of Me could well be an Irish name again. And as I say, that is just Lenin Valley. There are no Lenins living there now. The, <coughs> the Amish are there now. The Pennsylvania Amish have moved in and they found the land now. Now, we're sick of counties, and I, I took this because it gives an indication of what the Lenins had to do to settle the land. My full name is Thomas Barden. I was born in Mead, Ireland. Mrs. Barden's name was Honora Rourke. I was born in Roscommon, Ireland. I am now 58 years of age, and my wife 54. I landed in New York August 12, 1846, and she landed in the same place 1852. We were married in Pittsfield, Massachusetts on 30th of January 1855 and came to Minnesota in 1857, landing in the then village of St. Mary in this county, May 22nd. 
And the end of the lens are here at the same time, basically. This is why I chose this. We were then blessed with one child, Henry, 16 months old, one young boxer, one cow, six chickens, a dog, an old wagon, and a breaking cow, with 25 cents as cash capital, and a small stock of provisions. Our look was of a mixed variety, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But we always managed to keep the wolf from the door. <clears throat> they loaded their provisions to move out to Homestead in Hastings and came from there in wagon. This is as he wrote, you know, the grammatical mistakes and spelling mistakes with this as he wrote. And though, although the weather was cool and raw, we had to sleep under the wagon at night in order to save money to buy feed for the oxen. And as I said before, our money was all gone when we reached St. Mary, except 25 cents. Of course, we had to stop there. We made inquiry for vacant land and found a vacant 80 on Section 5 in Wilton County. We squatted and filed on it, and went to work to break up the sod and pan corn, potatoes and beans. This work had to be done before we could think of a house, and during this time we lived outdoor. And often the rain poured down upon us during the night while in bed, and then everything had to be spread out and dried during the sunshine. We were located on the border of the then Winnebago Indian Reservation. And lo and behold, we received a visit from eight or ten Indians, the first Mrs. Barden had ever seen. They were dressed in breech clouts and feathers and carried guns and knives. We thought her time had come, but it hadn't. She looked up, they looked about a while and then left. There was only one thing that saved me from destruction, and that was Mrs. B belonged to the Catholic Church. And you know there is no divorce allowed by that, so he was a Protestant, Mr. Barron was a Protestant, so there was no divorce, so that said there was no way that the wife was going to leave. And again the next sentence. She certainly had cause enough for divorce, for taking her to such a place. But she broke in our right, <laughs> which I think is a very good phrase. She broke in our right and soon became a heroic pioneer, having many face-to-face -face encounters with the Indians before they were removed in 1863, often staying at the place nights and days alone, except our little boy. So you can see, you, you, you know exactly what's happening, you've seen this in films, that the Indians are driven on, they come back to look to where they have been, the white man is settling there, and so on. <coughs> When I was speaking at the house, we had no money, no longer no nails, but there was plenty of good timber on the Indian lands. And this again is kind of, it walked, we did not steal it, of course, we, but then we took it in broad daylight without asking their leave. So they didn't steal it, they just took it in daylight, but they were actually stealing, I suppose. Which uh, the same we could not very well do, uh, you know, as we could not talk their language. And nearly all the other settlers went along to keep us company but they would see Indian timber. But, oh no, but then I got a good set of logs and kind neighbors helped me raise my house, as was the fashion, you remember, and the last money went for a little something to drink, for in those days we thought it not lucky to raise a home without it. So they had to drink in the house. It had, it had much for anything. Well, the next thing was, what were we to do for a roof? We had neither lumber shingles nor nails, then a good old Yankee neighbor told us to cut and peel the bark off them elm trees and lay them on some poles for a roof. And we were Irish enough ourselves to cut some sods and cover the bark to keep it from warping and also to make it warm for winter. Well, we don't live there now, but I tell you, it did us good service for a long time in our days of need. It tells us a little bit about the houses that he had left back in County Mead with the straw of earth and top. In top of timber. I've kind of inferred that from that. Finally, the Indians complained of us for taking timber. I think Major Mix was the agent, he did the agent, Indian agent. So one day he sent a posse of white men and half breeds to arrest and scare us off. I saw them coming as I was going home with a nice load of logs, and they steered straight for me and the oxen, they being well supplied to farm, firearms. Thought I to myself, I'm gone up. When they got close to me, one of them shouted, Whoa, and my oxen stopped. Then one of them asked, where did you get the logs? A thought struck me that I would answer him in the Irish language, for County Meath, no. Uh, the Irish language, as I was pretty good at it. 
So I gave him back correct answer to everything he asked. Finally, he got mad and swore a big oath, saying, You damn to Norwegian. I will soon take you where you will talk English and then pass on. So they took They were talking, he said, It's fluent in Irish from Copy Means at that time. Mm -hmm. Again, just an indicator. I'm not sorry. Okay, the next. Right. We had no grist mill nearer than Fairbog or Oakman, Oakman, and only oxen to make the journey with. So that fall, we made a mill of our own by taking a tin pan and punching it full of holes in the bottom. That was the mill there. With the bottom with a hammer and a nail, thus making a great roof. Then each evening, we would grate meal enough to do for the next day. If you take ten reports. Right. My first experience with wheat raising was not very flattening. I sold six portions of club meat in the spring. The next fall we cleaned the spot near the stack, and when the ground was frozen, we went at it with a flail. After two or three days, we got it fresh. We had no fanning mill then, so we waited till the wind blew and then cleaned our immense crop. I had just six bushels of very smutty wheat. I took it to the mill and had it ground. When I got home, the good wife was overjoyed with the prospect of some nice biscuits, which disappointment is a lot of men, and in this case, the lot of women. For when the biscuits were baked, they were as black as the ears of spades, with smut, and we had to fall back on corn, cakes, and mush. So his first experience of wheat didn't work very well. But the next year, the wheat was greatly better and more than to the acre. Besides, Christine Heffernan and I hit upon a new way of threshing. Again, another Irish man was made there. We trod out their tails. It was more, far more satisfactory than flaying by hand. So we got the option to walk on the wheat. Some people complain that wheat is cheap now, but in 59, 60 wheels to haul wheat 30 miles to Fairboard and sell it for 40 cents a bushel. And if we hauled it to Hastings 65 miles, we used to get 55, 6 cents a bushel. It took us from 5 to 6 days to make the Hastings trip with oxen. We were compelled to sleep under our wagons nights, and sometimes it rained or snowed on us. Times may be hard now for the tender footed, but they are not what they used to. Who was, but several dollars was in the hand of me. And that was written in 1897. It was republished in the West Texas Herald. So that just gives you an idea of what the Netherlands had to go through when they homesteaded. Okay? Yes? Would you be a big this year? What we do then? What would you do in America? Exactly the same. Oh, yeah. It's exactly the same. Yeah. The poor Indians were. Uh, just reduce 4,000 acres in there, having the way open plains. Okay. All right, any other question there? Right. So that's the Lenins. Mahoney. That's the second family that I highlighted in 1826. John Mahoney married Catherine McCarthy in 1845. Uh, he had two sons born in 1946, and John in 1948, both born in the townland of Bonquilla. With the next lot of children born, are born in the townland of Derry. So now we know that they have been evicted from Bonquilla. The last child was born in Farkey, the next child was born in 52 in Bonquilla, in a different townland. So we were able to figure out that they left sometime after Farkey. We know that they were evicted later station there. The five brothers emigrated to New York. Thomas died in 1899, buried in Holy Cross, Brooklyn. Five sons started out as laborers. Eugene became a bricklayer, and then he studied for the priesthood. Uh, in 1886, he called on his brothers, who were all wealthy builders in Manhattan. In one week, they purchased 12 lots on Madison and Putnam Avenue in Brooklyn. They bought, they bought the corner. Okay? <clears throat> Two weeks later, they completed a large one story church. 40 by 90 to hold it from the wooden church. Okay? So you can see they left Ireland, 1850s, 66, wealthy, wealthy enough to buy lots in Madison and put them in Brooklyn, and then the wooden church. At their own 
expense. The church was named in honor of our Lady of Good Council. By 1890, Russian Archer Church was built of dressed Norwegian granite. And Father Manny was a builder in his earlier time, went down to the docks of Brooklyn and he bought a Norwegian granite from the vessels that were coming in from Norway. They had granite as ballast when he bought it. And he secured it as a nominal press. He built a convent rectory in school. He died at the age of 48, which was very young, in 1901. And he had achieved quite a lot. And that's the church at the corner of um, Brooklyn and our other is Madison and Brooklyn. So that's the Madden family. Cashman. Uh, Cashman had a plot of land in his name, we saw him also in the, in the list. The house was down by 1849, and the next birth in the Cashman family is in Liz Lagine, which is in the parish of Inniscar. So he's gone out to the parish of Dunham Moor, and he's now in Liz Lagine, Inniscar. So again, from births, we can track him. Okay? And in 1850, he immigrated from the port. And I have two little slides that I put in last night. <coughs> Just echoes of today. In 1848, the London Mary left Dublin from Liverpool on December 1st with 206 deck passengers. Strong at sea, crew forced 206 below deck into a space 18 by 10 by 7. And 72 of them died of suffocation. <coughs> That's the cattle boats going from Dublin to Liverpool. And the cattle were accommodated on, in deck house <coughs> so the, the Irish who were escaping from famine were put down into the hole of the ship and 72 of them died. That, that's a report from the Times of London that didn't put in, uh, in 1848, the 8th of December. Alright? Just to kind of put them in the our common situations as well. We know we hear of traffickers, this is Liverpool, crimps, who were rank catchers, dock runners, sharpers, dishonest lodging houses, pilfering officers, and a numerous class at every seaport. In no place do these rapacious intergroup abound to a more alarming extent than in Liverpool. And that's from the Liverpool Mercury in December or September 1850. So that gives you an idea of what the Irish were facing. They had the language difficulties, they didn't know what money was like or whatever. And this is the second slide that I put in, just again echoes of today. They were tricked, overcharged, overpriced, and substandard food. <coughs> There's a, one particular case where a guy came with 40 pounds, and uh, some of the crimps, offered, they said, We give you money for California, for America. They don't use the money that you have, and we give you. And he exchanged 40 pounds for 40 Californian pieces, which was worth about two pence. Again, nothing changed, does it? And luggage stolen, an ideal situation, they had a bit of fear that they had stolen and taken away, and they had to go and get it, and then they were charged to bring it back. They charged the <coughs> Okay, so Cashman is in Liverpool going to Boston. He was in Boston in 1850, settled in Hanover, Massachusetts. He worked on the railway where he learned the skills of road building, surveying, and contracting. In 1875, within 20 years of getting there, he won 67 acres. Woodland and quarries, very important quarries for a developing city with roads and railways. To own quarries is very, very important. From 1862 to 1878, he built bridges and roads contracted by the Boston authorities. He died in 1879, the most prosperous immigrant in Hanover. He was the richest man in Hanover in 1879. And his great, great, whatever son at the moment, is one of the major contractors in Boston. He drives around in a white Mercedes, by the way. He was on his third or fourth wife, I think. But anyway, <laughs> so that's the Cashman thing. So we've dealt with the enemies, the Matinees, and the Cashman, okay? That's where the passions are buried. Sorry. Again, there's no need for description. Now, we 
we're changing, we're changing after a little while. <coughs> we're going to be with my own family of comments, and we have to take a rest before we go out of this. Now, the information that I have given you on the American side has come from people that have visited Dunham Moor looking for their roots. And it came and I got some of the information, and then with further research, I was able to build on that. Okay? The reason that I was out to America is such a they came to the Dunham Moor connections. <coughs> John England, when the Americans achieved their independence, the Catholic Church was not subject to British rule, so that was Catholic freedom, in a sense. So, the first Catholic bishop appointed in America, in the colony, in the ex-colonies, had all, had all the East Coast. That was his best. From the Canadian border down to Florida. And this guy here, John England, was the second Catholic bishop appointed, and his diocese was North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Okay? You, that's just a little bit about him. Look at there. James the Barrister. His father was in jail for teaching maths during the penal times. He was from Cork City. Mm -hmm. uh, John Newton was Cork City. Wasn't he co-adjunct for the Bishop of Cork? Sorry? Wasn't he co-adjunct for the Bishop of Cork under Royal? He, he was. Uh, that I can't answer, but I know he was parish priest in Bandon. Yeah, and he had problems with Loyola because Loyola wanted to agree with the English to allow emancipation in earlier. But with the visa that the English government could choose our bishops for us, and he said no. He refused, he refused to accept the open regions <coughs> when he was very here. And he's a very colourful character. Something has happened here now. Right, John, sorry. Yeah, John, Appointed Bishop of North Carolina and South Carolina, he let it be known to the British government that he had 8,000 volunteers from America who would come over and fight for Catholic emancipation. And he was the first Bishop of North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia and part of Florida. Okay? He refused to take the oath of allegiance. He arrived in Charleston with his sister, Father Carthory, and three students. One church, a few hundred Catholics. He spoke in the Senate, he established a Catholic paper. He opened seminaries, he gave a fever, devastated the homes of the Irish, established the Sisters and Old Lady of Mercy, modeled on the presentation of Arthur and Cork. And he had the Orsonites from Cork out there. He set up a convent, they didn't get on very well, they came back. Uh, a new convent, and sisters again from Cork. He set up schools for male and female slaves, special master slaves. He was an apostolic delegate to Haiti. And again, John. Am I pressing something? I'm just being awkward, I know that. Okay. Uh, this is Ireland in 1841, and he died and buried in the cathedral, the cathedral that he called St. Inverse Cathedral. He called it after King Bar. Father Tansy from Bandon was his assistant, and he is a character that deserves about three lectures, actually. But anyway, when he died, there were 16 churches, and he won't raise 12,000 Catholics. And his sister was buried in the cathedral also. Okay. Now, this is the Drummond War connection of all of this. Uh, Patrick Connell was born in Dunham in 1783. He married Anne, only daughter of an English family from Cornwall, who resided with Sir Nicholas Coulthurst in Arthur. No. I have, I have looked at the Coulthurst papers. I can't find any reference to Anne Ray. And I can't figure out how Connell from Dunham was married to an Anne Ray from Cornwall. Right? I've tried to. Okay. 
seven children, and by the age of eleven, and is buried in Malta, out the graveyard of the Vicar's home. His son Michael was the only member of the family that did not emigrate in the 1840s. It caught the tides, he was a tenant farmer of 23 acres, and in 1849 the states that on the farm there was a thatched house and was old and old repair, the measure was 40 feet by 16 by 6. The stable and car house were also out of repair. That's the, from the house books pre pre prefix validation. So that's just a description of the house he was living in. His son in America wrote a brief account of his father, and this is what he wrote. I don't know uh, how he could be the wealthiest man in Burma more. <laughs> in 1840, two pounds, he might be the wealthiest man. But his father wrote that he was the wealthiest man in Burma more because uh, application to business acquired an independent position. Now, whether he was a land agent or not, for the man about that, I have that suspicion in my mind, but I don't know. That's what was written. Uh, without land in the state, he was the wealthiest man in the world. He was a tenant farmer with houses over his hill. That's a lot of bankers and things. But he took a lot of money with him to America. He purchased an extensive estate in Savannah, Georgia, in 1848. His, his wife died in 1850 and was buried in Savannah. He donated his property in Savannah to the Sisters of Mercy, all that he had there, and he purchased more property in Columbia, North Carolina. He sent money back to the Dunamore Family Fund, there's a record of that, he sent money back to the Dunamore. He died in 1868 and was buried in St. Peter's Cemetery in Columbia, and his wife Anne was reinterred, was taken from Savannah, Georgia, and very in, in St. Peter's. Uh, that, that, uh, that's just a headstone there. Okay, it says Charleston, but that's incorrect. It's in Columbia. Now, his eldest son was J.J. O'Connor, Reverend J.J. O'Connor. And he was born on Memorial 1821. And in, in his writings, he said his earliest recollection was going to Mass to Father Cornelius Buckley, saying Mass, and he saw the aged priest, and he was determined to become what he was. He says that himself. I think that about ten grades or so after that, but anyway. <laughs> he was educated in the local head school, and then in Cork City. Bishop Delaney examined him, and found that he was suitable for the priesthood, and this is how he got to go to North Carolina. His sister Teresa, or his cousin Teresa Murphy, was a presentation nun. <coughs> and she mentioned to her sister superior, uh, who was a sister, named to her superior, that's incorrect there. The superior was a sister to Bishop England, Mary England, and uh, Bishop England sent her. Okay? So he hadn't started for the priesthood, but Mary England said, we've got here, okay? okay. Accompanied by his sister Julia, who was a candidate for the convent out there, they arrived in Charleston in 1840. Ordained in 44, and he was sent to Savannah, Georgia, and his sister, Sister Mary Baptist, sent with him to establish a convent. She got yellow feet and died in 73. He was transferred to Columbia. He ministered there for 23 years. His brother, next to night, L.P., also ordained in 1850, went to join him. They collected funds from the Irish all the way from New Orleans to New York for churches, built four churches and established a convent for the Sisters of Mercy, and their father financed it. Again, with his men in the war. <clears throat> in 1851, he opened St. Mary's College in Columbia for the Sisters of Mercy, and his second sister, a nun, taught in that country. He opened a boarding school in Columbia in 1857. He was president, his brother was vice president, and his third brother was a teacher. So the three convents there ran the school, the president, vice president, and teacher, all priests. 
J.P. was educated in New York, France, and Rome, and he was ordained in 1858. So, yeah. And again, the father financed all that. Father financed his education in Rome. Now, the Know Nothings was a very, very active organization in North Carolina at the time. They made life difficult for the Catholics. They attacked buildings, they harassed them, they made life difficult. They had to deal with all those for a while. Um, so in 1858, the boarders and the day pupils were intimidated as they were coming and going from the schools. In 1863, the mobs threatened the priests and threatened to destroy the schools. Um, just a few items from his life. He, the famous 69, the fighting Irish, when they were uh, <coughs> captured in Colombia. Uh, North Carolina, he administered to them. Um, in 1865, the Confederate troops confiscated parts of the convent buildings and used them as storehouses. He, he rode out to plead with German General Sherman, the Union General, not to burn the city of Columbia. But they tossed two thirds of the city, the soldiers moved it and became very drunk. So they burned over two thirds of the city. Convent, library, and college were all crushed. Holding a crucifix high, he led the sisters and the children from the convent and from the school, from the college, and they into a graveyard and they um, stayed there all night. That's the tongue because the tongue was being crushed. They also crushed the property of his brother, Michael, who would be meeting later on. L.P. O'Connell, he was a chaplain to the Confederates. He rose to the rank of major in the Confederate Army. Wounded in battle, he carried the scar for life. <coughs> he was held a prisoner under our car by Union soldiers when the Union soldiers succeeded in routing the Confederates. And he was appointed Vicar General of the Diocese of North Carolina and he died in 1891. This is the third brother. A ceiling fell. He was a, a paper function in Rome and the ceiling fell. And he was almost injured, but he actually pushed the Pope out of the way. So he always had a tremendous relationship with the Pope. And the Pope continually advised him in the time and distances. He served in South Carolina for 14 years, and then North Carolina. And he transferred to New York, where he built St. Michael's Church in Brooklyn. Made a Monsignor in 1894. No. Two of those evicted from Bunkhilla built churches in Brooklyn. This guy we saw his church, Eugene Manley, in this side. J.P. O'Connor built a church in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. That's his church. That's, <coughs> that's just him. <coughs> just one back again, no, just going through these. Uh, <coughs> Father Cronin, which of England, uh, assigned him to the Irish group. And William Runner, get from Cork, it's an unusual name for Cork at that time, he donated six acres to the Tavern Church Street, which was completed in 1843. We're not now again. So Father Cronin died, and Father J.J. O'Connor said the first Mass there in 1844. He's the first priest that we had in, in the three priests, okay? He said the first Mass there in 1844. And in 1877, he said the last Mass there. Okay? J.J. And in 1974, $10,000 was raised from donations to restore the roof and the interior of the church. Because after 1877, the church was used for everything. It was used as a hay barn, it was used as a storehouse, it was used as everything. And you'll see in a minute why. So, it, uh, 15,000 was raised in 1974 to restore the church. The church was rededicated in 1975, and 250 attended the ceremony, and it was named a National Historic Site by the U.S. Department of the Interior in 1979, the church. And there are two masses said there every year, St. Paddy's Day and St. Joseph's Easter. There are two days of the year that Mass is said there. That's the church. Built in 1843 for Irish immigrant gold miners. It was the fourth Catholic church built in this day. And
and this is the original building. Just some photographs of it. <coughs> that one itself is interesting because when they built the church, when the, when the miners built the church, they built the structure, and Mass was said there, but they didn't get any altar. So when the priest, when the visiting priest came around again, they had the altar built, and they've written on top of it, Have Amos Alcar, we have an altar. So that's what's written over the altar. We have an altar. And that's to this day the same. Okay? Priest quarters, the priest lived, they were traveling there. Can you imagine North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, was there was his diocese? And then you have North Carolina, that was the Romance Parish. So, <coughs> St. Harry's Day, the Irish flag and the American flag, the day on which Mass is said there. The Lonergans had stolen to them and they were drowned at sea on their way back to Ireland, having uh, got struck gold. They were drawn to see for the four brothers, and that's what says them. <coughs> More than 56 years. <coughs> JJ, the first priest that you met, I know I'm getting confused, you know, but JJ is the first priest you met. His health weakened, and he purchased 500 acres in 1872. He made a gift of the land to the Benedictine monks of St. Vincent Archabbey in Pennsylvania. So he donated 500 acres to the Benedictines and they came there in 1876 and that's why the church that you saw was out of use because the Benedictines came and they built a monastery so there was no longer any need for the smaller church and that's what then became Abraham and more of the And he joined the community, Father JJ joined the community as a laborer. He died in 1894 and is buried in the Abbey Province. That's his headstone, J.J. O'Connor. Okay? That's the Abbey, as it is today. And that's the church. And Mount Holly, the first church, the Timber Church that you saw, is about a mile or a mile and a half away from that. So if you understand what we're doing with that one. It's the baptismal font. Upon this rock, men once were sold into slavery. It's a big, big rock. Where the Black men were put on top of it in the market to be sold as slaves. So it says, upon this rock, men once were sold into slavery, now upon this rock, through the waters of baptism, men become free children of God. So as I say, that is the baptism of the church. That's just views of it. It's university also. Now coming back to the perambulation of what I hope you still with me, we'll come back to that again. I read it, so the tenants are promised their land again. And that's what I'm focusing on. <clears throat> so the Carthage Sander in 1950 gives a full account of, of the eviction. Up to 300 evicted in the month of July. An armed force of police, a deputy sheriff, the relieving officer of the district, a brigade of hard hearted scamps and from Blackpool, Larry Lane, and there are more prior to the job. Now this is a correspondent writing in, into the example, okay? So that's the language he uses. The landlord came with spikes, hasps and paddocks in order, paddocks right, in order to secure the doors against the return of their unfortunate inmates. The brigade tore, broke and flung their furniture and all the property from their houses and conveyed them a considerable distance to the public road. So they emptied the houses and took whatever bits of furniture they had and put them on the public road. Okay. They transported the firkins of butter to the road and spilled the keelers of milk, of new milk and cream. So the butter, the milk, the cream were all taken. They spilled them, didn't matter, they took them to the public road. Two or three of the brigade kept watch at each house to prevent the occupiers or the occupants from returning. Cattle were turned out on the highway. All crops were seized, and this is July, within one month of being reaped, of being reaped. So, the cattle out and the crops left. 
The tenants put up their bedstead and furniture by the roadside. They have to keep a close watch on their cattle as some were impounded when they strayed back onto the land and seized for legal trespass. You know, the cattle were used to be in certain fields. They're no longer on the road. If the cattle go back in, they're seized and impounded for legal trespass. Okay. After four days, Mr. Wise agreed to let the crops at evaluation. But they must fork out the amount before they are allowed to dig the own potato. So they have to, dig, to pay to dig their own potatoes. And he's prepared to leave, leave the crops at evaluation, to let the crops at evaluation. This is the comment of the guy that brought into the examiner. These people are honest, moderate, and industrious. They had the means to pay the rent and were willing to do so. As long as Mr. Wise or any landlord would be empowered by the law of the land to treat its fellow creatures in such a manner that the law cannot and will not be respected, nor will there be peace, contentment, or prosperity in this unfortunate country. If the landlord can do what this guy has done. Now, you might have noted that he said some of the tenants would be left back in. So Michael O'Connor was the only tenant left back. So Michael and Michael O'Connor was married to a Bridget O'Connor. So in O'Connor married to O'Connor. And the Bridget O'Connor is my connection, not the other way. Okay? <coughs> His father, brothers, and sisters moved to Columbia, South Carolina in the 1840s. So all the family are in South Carolina except Michael, who's at home in the farm. He stayed on the farm in 1852, which is two years after the eviction. So he's in for two years. Okay. Again, I don't understand what is happening here. And that, and that's it. Because I can't track down Henry Wise. He seems to disappear after 1850. <laughs> so, Michael, his wife, and their five children, aged seven, five, three, two, and three months, they all emigrated to Colombia in North Carolina in 1852. Okay? And you might remember way back on the slide, the population of Bonquilla had gone from 100 and something down to 17 or whatever it was. There were seven in there. So it's gone down to almost single numbers. By 1860, within eight years, he owned real estate value 2,000, personal property value 200, carpenter, farmer, and he had a shop on Main Street, Columbia. Mm -hmm. By the 1870, look at the census. He had real estate 6,000, personal real estate 1,000. He was a father of 12 children. He had uh, seven children had been born in the States, uh, four died in infancy, and he had two black servants. <coughs> now we're talking about the Civil War. Sherman burned all his property. All the land that he had, the old offices and everything that he had, was burned by General Sherman. He, again, he held office as a trial judge during the Restoration. So he was appointed a judge after the Civil War. And as I say, this seems to suggest that he had unionist sympathies, that he, was, that he was with the Union, in other words, <coughs> against slavery. He moved the family to Fort Mill, North Carolina, and bought a large farm there. And there in North Carolina, J.J. was there in the monastery. Lawrence was nearby in Shadrock, North Carolina, two of his brothers. And uh, these are all born in Dunmore. Patrick, he was educated in Europe. He was sent to Europe to avoid the Civil War. And he was elected to the state legislature, and he was married with one daughter. And became a sister of mercy. Dennis became priest and bishop of Richmond, Virginia. Michael stayed at home, unmarried. Julia stayed at home, unmarried. That's the bishop. And the. <coughs> sorry, Michael, I'm sorry, not stayed at home. This way. Uh, 1850, born and done a war. Physician, he was married. He had one son, Charles Michael. 
and Charles had two sons, John and Charles William, and I can't track them after that. Julia lived in Fort Mill, died in 1933. Joseph, Fort Mill. Lawrence, president of the Machinist Union, and is the Catholic Knights of America, died in 1900. Robert Wise, he's entered as being caretaker in the town land with house, offices, and land. That's the, the, the register of land in 1862-63, Robert Wise is caretaker there of the whole town land. Okay? And in 1863, Jeremiah Goggin is the only tenant on 390 acres. More places here out, just one farmer with whole town land. That's it, thank you. Which the department lost because of that. 
because they didn't send a person down to walk around with it to, to maintain ownership, to claim ownership. So there are, no, uh, just to say the perambulation books were necessary for this particular event because the uh, whole homeland was being, uh, all the tenants were being evicted and they wanted a rundown on acreage, tillage, good land, bad land, whatever. You know. The house books are available, as you know, for all of them. Uh, as, as you mentioned, there were uh, legal. What was, uh, what they as legal? Those yes, evictions. Or would they ever have the evictions? Yeah. Would the landlord own the land? The tenant was the tenant. There's no rates. No, no, no. no. If these guys had, were willing to pay the rent because that that, that, that didn't matter. Where did you say the house books? Huh? Sorry. Where are the house books? The house books again. The national national. House books and the valuation office. Um, the valuation office then. Well, the last slide then came from the valuation office as to the, the change of ownership of the land. Maybe you write it that there in the, in the valuation office, is it? The house books. Valuation, uh, valuation office is the cancel books. Yeah, but the house books are in the national office. 